moved. Um, all right, we moved from um, Batesland, my mother and my siblings and I, to Castlewood, South Dakota. That's where my grandparents uh, were living at the time. And at that time, my mom was, she taught English, South Dakota history in junior high. And she eventually became a theater director for high school. So she also did oral and terp and declam. And as much as uh, we Zimagas like our basketball, um, <laughs> our mother made sure we were, were in such things as declam, oral and terp, um, and any of any of anything where we'd have to give up, get up and speak in public, or you know, just be a part of a of a, a communal group outside of athletics. So that's where I actually got my start in in performing. Um, I did some community theater in Watertown for a while when I lived in that area, and I hadn't done done anything since I think it was like two thousand six. So then Rihanna. Um, ended up writing like three different parts into 2012, the musical for me, um, which was really cool. It was really neat. It was a neat experience. Um, um, I do have some photos to share. I, can, I guess I can share my screen and kind of show people, you know, uh, th this was some of the people I met. Um, can you, can people see my screen? Thumbs up. All right. <laughs> Um, here, I this is uh, my good friend uh, Emmy, her many horses, Lorna, her many horses. Uh, me in the background here on Emmy's brother Charlie. We initially met doing 2012 the musical, and then this was our original cast to begin with, which was Inez, Dakota, Rihanna. Yeah, our, I'm sorry, uh, Emmy, her men, her many horses. There's Rihanna. I'm hanging out back here somewhere. There I am, uh, Chase Manhattan, who Charlie replaced Marissa Carr and Donovan Mount. So that was that was my my uh, initial group that I met doing theater here in the Twin Cities, and from there it ended up other opportunities that would present itself. Um, I did stories from the drum with the Guthrie. Uh, Turtle Theater Collective here in the Twin Cities, which was started by uh, Marissa, my friend Marissa Carr and Ernest Briggs. Uh, we did a very diverse cast that uh, we did Our Town. That was an amazing project to work on. Uh, met a lot of people through, through more people through there. Um, when the stories from the drum through Marissa, that's how I met Larissa Fast Horse and Ty Defoe. And in 2019, uh, we collaborated together as a community, uh, different people, natives from the community coming and bringing stories that they have written. Uh, that was the first time I ever written anything. And uh, it was amazing to have that performed on the Guthrie stage. I had written a piece called uh, They Came to Dance, and it was about my grandma, Louise uh, Dubray Zimaga, and her, her sister, Cynthia uh, Mart, or Cynthia Dubray Mart. Um, Older people within the community there will remember who they are. They loved going to powwows. They loved being able to take their shawls and going to dance and watching people watching people dance, watching watching this whole community be able to come back together after our our long absence of being able to be in the public with our celebrations, whether that be dancing, our cultural ceremonies that we practice. Um, I remember in, in 1978, it was about the time when my grandma and all her sisters showed up to start making regalia because we started uh, in Pine Ridge having all these dance groups and ha you know being able to compete and go different places. It was pretty amazing. So from there, telling their story on the Guthrie stage, it was amazing. From that experience, we went and um, the Native Advisory Council for the Guthrie Theater was established. And what the Guthrie wanted to do was uh, bring more Native people into theater in the Twin Cities, as well as for us, we wanna see, we wanna see more Native people on stage. I think that's, that's a, a huge thing right now. Um, 
we all have our fingers, toes, eyes crossed for Lily for Sunday. So, so uh, nothing but get good energy going out there. Hopefully we have a, a, a woman take home an Oscar that represents our community this, this weekend. Um, but being able to work within community, uh, I think that was my biggest push. My, my, my biggest push as far as being involved in theater and doing things with theater here in the Twin Cities is to establish those connections with community. Um, I don't know, sometimes it's hard for me to think of myself as, I like to perform, I like to be on stage, but really I, I see myself more as wanting to bring others with me or pull other people up on stage. It was amazing. Uh, the Guthrie just this past fall, the per performance I was last in was uh, For the People, which is an all indigenous cast, um, except for one, one non-native who is, the, um, who is a, w one of the characters within the play. Um, that was an amazing experience. So I got to meet uh, people that I consider family now that I never thought in my life I would ever, ever, ever be able to meet. Um, West Studi was a part of this production, Kalani Cuepo, Katie Anvil Rich, uh, Sherry Foster Blake. Uh, when I think of Sherry and Wes, I think of how, how much they have done opening doors for, for Native performers, a Native storytelling just within, within Hollywood. Um, that was an amazing experience. I, I also have, I do have some pictures of that as well. I can share some of that. Um, I'll hit the share button here. Let me know if anybody has any questions or wants to ask me any, any questions. Uh, so here is, this was the original cast. This was, this, this, this whole production was created in the community of Minneapolis by Larissa Fasthorse and Ty Defoe. And there were talking circles with community members. Community members were invited to the readings. So they had input as far as what story was, was to be told in the Twin Cities about the native community here. Um, this was amazing. From, from this group of people, we have, uh, uh, Isabella Star LeBlanc was part of the original cast, Inez Dakota, uh, Ugi uh, Push. Um, we were able to finally get the production on the stage. And that was this past this past fall. So this is Nathaniel and myself. Uh, it was a comedy. It was about uh, a task force here in the Twin Cities fictitious but it was really it was really amazing to hear people ask questions like if we were really a thing like non-natives especially were like is there I remember one of the first questions in one of our talk facts was is there really that much infighting within the within the task force and we're like this is fictitious this is just this was kind of a, a humor that definitely natives natives understood and got uh, but to be able to perform that and be a part of that on a stage with predominantly non-native stories, especially when um, the Guthrie really had this initiative to, to acknowledge land and have a land acknowledgement before every performance, which is awesome, that's, that's great. Um, I myself am always someone who, for non-natives to make an acknowledgement on the land uh, I think there also has to be a little payback to that. Uh, what, what are you going to do for Native community? What are you going to do for people who are who are you're inviting back to this space that was that is, I mean, theirs. It was it, it's theirs. It was treaties violated, illegally taken. We go through we go through all of that all all over Turtle Island here, and then. I have to show this photo because this one cracks me up. <laughs> this is my sisters, my auntie and my niece and my mom, Kathy, with West Studi. The reason I show this is with the flowers I hold holding, it looks like uh, 
Kathy's getting married to Wes here. <laughs> when people when people see this picture they're like Kathy where's art <laughs> he was over on the side but yeah this was it was it was pretty amazing to to meet these people and to be able to network in that those areas as well um oh just an all over great experience and I and I think like with my story as far as performing here in the Twin Cities my story as far as um being a part of community, that has always been the one thing that has stood out for me. Like I, I, I want to be a part of my community. I want to be able to um, provide whatever I can to help community, whether it's the native community I'm from or the native community that I'm a guest of here. Um, I, I, I guess I would just, I'm going to take a break and ask if anybody has any questions or if there's anybody's had any questions or comments or. Yeah, I think um, maybe you could talk a little bit about like the collaborative process that might differ from like a traditional like Western theater process. Absolutely. Um Ty and Larissa, they have um, Indigenous Direction, uh, a company that they go into different theater spaces around the world, uh, or, or around well, yeah, really around the world. Uh, they they've been in other countries here in the United States. I know I I went to some of their classes that they offered uh, at the Guthrie for Guthrie employees. So this was to help decolonize those spaces in the way. Um, you know, uh, Western civilization, Western civilization sees how theater, how theater happens or how it should happen. Um, when we began for the people, our very first rehearsal, Larissa made it obvious to everybody that was in the room that from lighting, sound director, the artistic director of the Guthrie to, uh, anyone who was custodial helping out wherever they could, that everybody in that room, including the actors, including the writers, we're all equal. We all have a role to play. No one, no, we, we, we met in a circle to begin. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the theater that, that I do here in the Twin Cities, where it's really different from, from just uh, other theater I've done that was non-native, uh, most of the time, I have a I have a workshop I'll attend today. I'm going to assume we we start in a circle. I'm going to assume uh, we'll probably smudge. We'll open up with 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 people being able to just do a check in quick to see how they're feeling, um, what what they're hoping to bring for, to the process for, for the day. Uh, some of these things uh, I I haven't seen in in working with other theater groups in other theater spaces. So it was really, it was really important. And it was really, I, I know there were so many people that came up to us throughout our, our run to tell us how different this process was. And for me, um, I, I, I guess I'm blessed in a way that doing theater here in the Twin Cities, this is the process that, that I know and that I'm used to. Um, creating space for community, creating that safe space where people are able to talk and speak their mind and speak speak what's going on with them. Um, I know at one point in time, uh, one of our rehearsals, the energy just felt off. We didn't quite understand where it was coming from. So we just took a pause and we stood in, the, in a circle and we just smudged off and recalculated. Reca Basically, it's like a recalculation, recalibration, right? Just kind of get rid of whatever negativity was there. Think about our intent of what we're doing and why we're doing these things. Um, those things are very different. Um, most of the time within a traditional theater setting, you get your script, go memorize your part, you come back, um, you you play a few theater games. I always call them theater games, warm ups, you know, get, get your voice going, get things going, and then boom, right into it. For us, it was more of a collaboration of, of, does this sound right? Does this feel right? Culturally, is this appropriate to be saying? Um, 
How are elders going to feel about this? Let's invite in elders into the space so, so they can watch us perform and listen to us and, and ask questions and make suggestions and for community to be that much a part of it to be heard. I was talking to Clementine last week when uh, talking about what initially I wanted to do for this presentation. I was really hoping that I could do it in person. I really want to network. I really want to make relatives and friends with people in that Rapid City area. I know uh, Emmy, her many horses and I have talked several times about how much we would love to see people from our community write stories and tell stories together. Um, that's something I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really wanting to do. I, I know em Emmy is as well. Like we, we want to see our stories told by us. We want to write our stories. We want to perform our stories. We have so much talent within our communities. And for me, it was amazing to come to the Twin Cities and getting to meet other Lakota and Dakota people here that were from home. Um, Sarah Palatsky Warza, she is a PhD student uh, at the U of M in, in decolonizing theater spaces. I just had the pleasure of meeting her. She's now on the Native Advisory Council. She's from um, uh, Sisseton Wapaton area. I believe I believe she was Twin Brooks is where she grew up, the area she grew up in. But to to meet her, that was amazing. To meet Emmy, like 10 years ago, amazing. The, the different projects we've been able to work on together. Uh, just having that, that ability to create things in our way and share, share, you know, share those things. Uh, it's important. It's something that I, I really am hoping we're, we're able to share with one another and, and do more of. I really appreciate that. And I'm really, you know, like there's been some really great native theater projects, of course, produced by, are written by Larissa, but, um, I also know of your production with the Zikala Shaw um, mm -hmm. story. So maybe if you could share a little bit about that, I think it's really yeah. exciting. Yep. Um, Zikala Shaw, that, that's another project um, that I'm always going to tie back to. My experiences here have always been, or my, my experiences with, with uh, getting uh auditions or being invited to be a part of something has always been because of community I have made here, friends, relationships I made here. Uh, it was the 2020 during the pandemic, Sequoia Hawk, they, they contacted me wanting to know if I'd be interested in playing uh, Zit Gala Shah in a film that they were putting together. And the story of that in itself, how this film was being created was amazing. It's an artistic film. It has Zit Gala Shah at four stages of her life, 10 year old, 20 year old, um, 30 year old, and then 50 year old Zit Gala Shah, 40, 50 year old Zit Gala Shah. Um, for people who know of Zit Gala Shah, uh, being from South Dakota, I know I grew up with my unchis talking to me and telling me about her all the time. She was a suffragette, not just for women, but for, for Native people. Uh, she started the Council of Native of, of American Indians in D.C. She was a musician. She was an educator. She herself went to uh, boarding school with the thoughts of it being something great and wonderful and it turning into be nightmares, which has happened for a lot of our, our relatives, our parents, our grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, ancestors so for her to to live through that and be able to be in these spaces where even now it's rare to see women there let alone a, a native woman a Nakota woman from 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 Yankton like th that that to me is amazing that history that we don't some of us know but a lot don't often know about her 
when Sokoya uh, approached me about the project, them and uh, a librettist, Hannah Johnson, who uh, both Anishinaabe, uh, Hannah's from up by Duluth, they were trying to figure out a project they could collaborate on that, that was, was about a native woman. And they found Zid Gala Shah. And Hannah was like, this is the, this is my person. Like this is, I'm a librettist. Zid Kala Shah wrote the Sundance opera and it was, it was re it was taken away from her by a, a white professor and used that it was his. So they came up with the idea uh, to write the libretto from Zid Kala Shah. Some of it's from Zid Kala Shah's own words and, um, a portion of it is in Dakota language. So it was amazing to collaborate with so many native people on this project as well. Uh, Sequoia Hawk, Liz Jacola. She, Liz Jacola did all the composing of the music. Um, an opera theater company, company here in the Twin Cities helped produce it. The, the film is, is I think people, we, we had it at Racing Magpie last July and we had a wonderful turnout. It was, it was, it was amazing to see so many people in, from community wanting to see this production. Um, we, we wanted to be able to, to let people know there's a documentary of the making of the film. And then the film itself is, is an artistic interpretation of Zit Gala Shah at these four stages in her life. Um, and within the film, it's just between uh, Emmy, myself, uh, Jacelyn Western Boy. We 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 play ourselves, like Zit Kala Shah through ourselves, like what it means for us to be Native women at this stage in our lives and the Native women that helped us get there, especially someone like Zit Kala Shah. That project, oh my goodness. <laughs> I think it took two years because of the pandemic to make, but we were all all on board with it. Like we all we all wanted it to happen. We would get to a point where, oh, maybe we can all meet together in the cities and do a rehearsal and someone had COVID. Okay, well, here's here's your chunk of time where you'll be able to, I'll be able to film you. Oh, we can't. So and so has COVID. <laughs> so it was we had those 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 battles to to get the to get the project to where it's at now. Uh, that project is evol is total totally evolving all the time. Uh, we would like this to be. I know, Emmy and I have talked about wanting the music portion of it. We we both come from a college where we both sang in college backgrounds in wanting to have uh, choral compositions put together for for native students to sing in in harmony these these different songs from the libretto. Um, we're wanting a stage production of, of Zit Gala Shah, a Minari Kindoa Zit Gala Shah opera, where we could have a live performance. Um, just so many things. I have a, I'm doing a screening of it at St. Mary's College in April. Um, I have some, I have some images I can share of that as well. <laughs> yeah, that would be really yeah. great. Let me, let me pull those up. And then I can also share um, where, I'll hit the share button here. So this was our, our production we did at Racing Magpie, yay. And then um, here's Emmy, myself and Jacelyn. And then he, here's, more of our cast and our crew. Uh, on the left is Hannah Johnson, myself, Sequoia Hawk, Thomas Draskovic. I've worked with Thomas on numerous projects. He's also on the Native Advisory Council. Um, he was our, our he, he did music direction for us for this project. There's uh, Emmy, her many horses, Jagger Jacola, this is Liz's daughter. She played the younger Zid Kala Shah and then Jacelyn Western Boy. But I also have, um, which I, I can share too um, in the, you know, once the live feeds up on uh, Racing Magpie's Facebook websites where you can 
go to an opera theater company and you scroll towards the bottom, there are several films of the making of this project, which is very neat, very interesting to watch. I would like to see this, this film shown more in schools. I, I think it's a very education, it's an artistic, artistic film that would be very educational for students. Um, important for community to have talkbacks and conversations about about boarding schools, boarding school trauma, um, boarding school uh, successes, people who have endured, people who have uh, have have created wonderful, amazing things from such tragedy. How would um, how would one if you wanted to show the little documentary about the production? Like how, how does one go about getting in contact with folks or like what's the invitation process? Are you all, do you invite you all to the performers? Like how does that work? At this point in time, um, if uh, I can share the link to an opera theater company's uh, web website, most specifically, Minaki Kindawazi Kalasha Opera. Scrolling to the bottom, you they have all of the videos. You'll see them small little boxes at the bottom of the documentaries of the making of. So anyone can see those at any time. If you would like for us to be part of a showing or a viewing, I know Sequoia has felt like all of us have felt because of the topic of boarding school and, and, the, and the fact of boarding school trauma they would always like someone, one of us to be there with, with this project right now, just to be able to, to ex explain or be there, offer, um, offer some healing space for people if they need it. Um, but I know uh, contacting an opera theater company, if you contact me, I can put, I can put you in touch uh, with, with being able to get it and view it. Um, I know that they've shared links before with other other places to, to go ahead and view it. Um, the big thing that we've had with these are, 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 are being able to have a talk back with community. We really want to know what community thinks, what they feel, um, how, how they respond to, to the film and to the documentary. So yeah, please contact myself or go through an opera theater company if, if you're interested in doing more viewings, showings of it. Awesome. And then I had a other question, or maybe you could discuss this. You talked about both you and Emmy being able to, you know, sing in college or have a musical background. Uh, what, like, what, what are you, how would you encourage a youth to get involved with theater or musical theater or um, start to go down this path? Because I know not all of us, like, I didn't have band or choir when I was in high school, but I, we did have a drama club, but you know, I I was never pointed in those directions in the way that I think other folks are. So what encouragement or what things would you tell young people who wanted to get involved in theater to, to do, to try? Um, so any advice? Absolutely. Uh, I think Emmy and I have both had said too, at one time I, I told her, I said, I remember joining a ch the church choir uh, when I moved to Castlewood we well we had choir and stuff in high school that that if you have that as a young person if you have choir in 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 school take it if there are theater in school take it if you have oral inter declam take it any of those things that you can and your school offers take it the other thing would be go online look for resources online um I know at times the Guthrie has offered classes for uh, adults. Uh, they've offered classes for, for youth that are free, uh, free to native community classes uh, that you can take online and be a part of. Uh, the other thing is grab each other, like get a group together, start your own thing, do your own thing. I laugh at like one of, for me, one of the most hilar hilarious storytellers I've ever encountered in my life that I wish would get out there and write and I wish would get up 
in front of people and tell stories, the stories he writes, is my my older brother, Austin. He is hilarious. He's kind of rugged sometimes, but he's hilarious. Um, do, do those type of things, write every day. Uh, even if you record yourself or have to record yourself, do that. But look, young people, you have this whole, whole online universe that you can tap into, find community. If you can't find community, start it, start it. And then let me know, I wanna see you. <laughs> I wanna see you perform. I will share what you're, with, with people what you're doing. I would love that. Same. I would love to see like a traveling Ocheti Shakoin theater mm -hmm. group in South Dakota, just going like place to place. Um, what, so what, you know, you, you talked a little bit about, uh, right. Boarding school stories, thinking about Zikala Shah's experience. What other stories would you want to see in theater or um, you also highlighted the importance of women's voices. So just maybe if you could discuss the that, like what type of stories or narratives are you hoping to see? Do you want to write? I would love to know what you have like working in your brain about um, the ki kind of stories you want you want to participate in. Me, I would love to see here. Uh any native stories like when we think about what is lakota storytelling what is lakota performance well i'm lakota if i wrote a story about about walking my dogs that's still a lakota story i mean just everyday life things that we do write about it make it a story um i know it really m murdered missing indigenous women I'm so I'm so glad it's becoming more and more at the forefront. To me, it'll never be enough. I I just watched the was it the ABC ABC special of uh, Savannah Greywind. When that whole when that whole story was coming about, I I just I felt so much for the parents. But to finally hear her story, I, I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts and and try try and see what's going on in in different communities what non natives are saying about natives in 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 these situations and i was just totally shocked by the fact that no one seemed interested in telling her story so to see it i was i was very 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 happy to see it but how many other sisters mothers aunts uh who spell it, spirit relatives that are are part of that MMIW, MMI, MMIR, sorry. It's part of that, that their stories don't get told. They're swept under the rug. Um, Marcy Rendon created a piece called Say Their Names that I did a reading of last, not this past fall, but the fall before in at the History Theater. I would love to see that production come to stage. I would love to uh, be able to be a part of that. Uh, I love the way Marcy wrote it. I love the way how uh, when we we perform this piece, even as a reading, every time we we say one of these these uh, women's names, women and girls' names, we were doing a chanshasha offering for each one of them, and then uh, once the performance was over. Uh, I took that to the to the uh, river. I live close to the Mississippi River, and was able to scatter there and just have a moment with that. I would love to see more of that kind of storytelling. You ask me about what I would like to write. I mean, something that's been rolling around in my head for some time, and I've mentioned. I just mentioned to Sequoia Hawk, and I had a conversation last night. I have. Uh, uh, Spider Woman Theater from New York is here in the Twin Cities and they've offered a workshop for us today. So uh, three, free of charge, see what I mean? Find those things, go to them. They're free, when they're free, go. <laughs> um, but uh, when I was visiting with Sequoia last night, I told them, I've had this story in my head for a while about this all native women group 
of women that is like this vigilante type of task force. And there's one that's very quiet and meek and each one has a backstory. There's one, um, I remember when I first met Lorna Haynes, uh, she is bigger than life <laughs> character just when you look at her. And I'm like, I'd be scared if I was a dude to meet this chicken and alley. <laughs> Like, and so that's kind of one thing that I've kind of had, I've, that I would love to take the time and write a story about that. Uh, more so because I would love to see the, I would love to see the victory part of it, even in little, little parts. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen True Detective, uh, Night Country, but my, my f friend and, and uh, she was also on the Native Advisor Council, Isabella Startle LeBlanc plays Jodie Foster's daughter in it. Isabella is a phenomenal actress, phenomenal. Uh, she's played my daughter in a couple different things. I think we did a couple different readings where she was my daughter. So I was a little taken back, but by the way Jodie was treating her, but that's just as a, you know, as a, as a Ina, that was just how I felt at the time. But I loved how, if you haven't seen that series, watch it the way it ended. That was power for me, finding out what happened to those men or what finding out what they did and what happened to them. That that's that's the kind of medicine I like. Um, I don't know if it's good or bad. I don't know if it's vengeful. I just think it's uh, justice. So that's kind of what's been rolling around in my brain. <laughs> I would love to see a vigilante. I have a um there's a short film called A Red Girl's Reasoning. It's really hard to find, but it's kind of the the a vigilante. It's a native woman that and it's it's like 10 minutes. It's really short. It was filmed in Canada, but it is that kind of vigilante. She people come to her and they have a abuser that they want justice for, mm -hmm. you know, and so she goes out and she finds them. Um but I think that I would love I would want I would watch that. I would want to be in it. Yeah. Um <laughs> <laughs> and I do think, right, that some of these, so much of the our, our narratives that we see very common produced about our communities, right, are are very, like, there's a lot of hurt in it. And so um, I think vigilante justice is sometimes needed because we have to be able to have multiple conversations about what it means to, to rectify and reconcile, right? And so um, I'm down to see more of it. <laughs> But I think uh, it's really exciting to 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 have you share your experiences because I know you also have your graphic designer, your full time job, and you're participating in these theater spaces. So, um, I if you can just share kind of like how how do you do it all? <laughs> <laughs> or some advice, right? I think. Um, sometimes we forget our creative practices and our artistic practices and um, right the goal of Racing Magpie is to uplift you know our cultural bearers and the folks that are are you know in in it for um, uplifting our artistic and creative practices so if you can just kind of share maybe in the, this kind of ending section of just what advice you have to keep um, honing your practice and how do you balance, you know, both the a job in it, but also being able to 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 do all these things that you've been able to do. Well, my my job I have I work at a new age publishing company, so I I've, I've been there for at Llewellyn Worldwide for fifteen years now. Um, that in it, uh, itself, um, the the work I do is a lot of production work, so I'm not really creating a whole lot uh, other than from creating assets. Uh, I, I put together their catalogs and whatnot. I used to do cover design. So for me, I've gotten into a rhythm or know my job well enough to, so I know, I know when I'm busy, when I'm not busy. I know when I'm able to, you know, bank the time, like I was able to bank some time off and then take it off for, for, to do for the people. And uh, I work for a company that's gracious enough for, for, for me to do that. I also work for a company that is uh, gracious enough to start to start hearing and having conversations about cultural appropriation, especially within the new age community, um, how things like that uh, need to be addressed. 
how we need more native representation there. Uh, it's gotten better, I think, for a lot of places, but it's still not where it should be. Um, I, I've had, had a lot of native people are like, you're still there? Oh my goodness, that must be hard working there. Well, being the only native there, yeah, yeah, that's hard. But if I wasn't there, I think, how much stuff would get produced or would people non-natives think are okay because it's been published? Um, so yeah, I, I I feel I have I have I have my skills as a designer there. Plus I I also have have has have my skills as being a Lakota person and being connected to culture and being connected yet to my community to be able to have a voice uh, to uh, you know to stand and and show some activism towards our community. Um, that being said. Um, being able to have a job like that has made it easy for easier, easier, not easy, easier to go, okay, I'm going to take this creative hat off and I'm going to put this one on. Um, but a lot of times that's what I have to do. Um, I know a lot of my freelance jobs that I took last year, I, I let everybody know, okay, this has to come to an end in August because I'm not going to be available until next year. Once I started my, my rehearsals in September, uh, we were done in mid-November, and I just needed that month and a half to just reset. Uh, also gave me an opportunity. How I reset is I like to be around my family. Uh, I like to be around friends. I really, I enjoy um, my stepmom, my uh, cat, my color, Ina Noom or Ina Numpa. She means the world to me. So being able to have conversations and reconnect with her, um, heading back to Rapid. Even getting to visit my Unchi's, where my Unchi rests, uh, getting to see my dad, my my family, that's a big, big thing on how I reset. Um, cleaning is another thing I have to do to reset. <laughs> uh, but a lot of the projects that I take on or a lot of things I do, um, I want to make sure, I want to make sure uh, it's uh, somehow a uh, community is benefiting from it. Our community has some type of benefit from it. I don't always, I don't think of it as this is for me or I'm going to put myself out there for th this. Uh, if I put myself out there, it's more so I want other people, other uh, native artists to see and go, you know what? I could do that. She could do that. I could do that. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that community. Um, one thing I'll share in closing up is one of the projects I worked on at the Native Advice with the Native Advisory Council at the Guthrie was just as we were coming back from the pandemic. Heidi Shrek, uh, she's a Tony Award winning uh, playwright. She had the play "What the Constitution Means to Me." Loved the play. The play is 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 about her as a young person, a uh, young woman being in constitutional debates to earn money for college, how the constitution and her views on it had changed as she got older, especially when we're talking about issues about a women's rights, women's bodies. Um, as the Native Advisory Council, when that, I think it was 2020 when that, when that show, no, 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 2021, because it was the year after that, the whole, you know, the pandemic times. Anyway, uh, when when the show was going to be put on the Guthrie stage and we were told, oh, yeah, uh, do you guys want to go? We were like, okay, do the community, does does the theater community know we exist? Like, or is there going to be an announcement of who we are? And, and it was like, yeah, yeah, we, we definitely want to do that. We want to put it in a play bill. So we were having some issue as the as the Native Advisor Council about um, Heidi's story is tremendous. It's from a uh, white woman's perspective on the Constitution, and we kind of felt odd that like it doesn't have to do with definitely doesn't have to do with natives. When the Constitution was written, it had nothing to do with natives, nothing to do with black folks. It had definitely had nothing to do with women. We get that. Uh, there were some things that she mentions within her play that were, you know, were triggering. They, that it mentions the force, the government's forced sterilization of Native women and Black women in this country. And we wanted to make some type of a 
splash a statement with this production. Uh, Larissa knew Heidi and, and put us in contact with her. And as to represent the Native Advisory Council, I, I went along with the meeting because we wanted to create something. And as a designer, I'm like, oh, I could put this hat on and we can make something happen here. So we came up with uh, you, the you are on land native you are on native land artwork um oh yeah this so so it started out as a sticker and it went on every single mini constitution that um i thought I used to have it in my desk here but uh at the end of the play of, Han of heidi's play she does a constitutional debate with either a young person of color a young trans person a young um a young person who has, let's just fake it, face it, young people seem to know a lot more. I, I, I just, it's something I believe. I look at our constitution, it's over 200 years old. We have one of the oldest constitutions in the United States. Our young folk are who change our society. Our young folks are who society is changing for. So when this constitutional debate happens, we talk, they talk about the fact that a lot of the things that are written in the constitution needs to change with society. So on these many constitutions handed out, we started out with just this design being a sticker on these many constitutions. And it was amazing to see people's reactions, non-native people's reactions. They get this little mini constitution and they look at it and there's a little sticker that says you're on native land. And it was like, hmm, hmm, hmm. And then within the playbill, it talked about the Native Advisory Council. It talked about um, the U.S. Supreme Court cases that favored in, in favor of Native people, such as the Lakota Nation and our, uh, you know, our beautiful uh, Black Hills. Um, so from there, I'll share my screen again. Some of the 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 items that I created and what it's done for a community. Let me see, here we go. So here's the initial artwork that I that I created. Uh, from this, we discussed, we should put this on items for the gift shop. So I, I agreed we should do that, but the, the only way I, I, I'm myself and the Native Advisory Committee would sign on to that is if every single penny went to native community here in the Twin Cities. It just it just felt like if people were gonna buy all this stuff, the Guthrie definitely doesn't need that money. But our, we have we have organizations here in the in the Twin Cities. So the first year we sold, um the money went to Ikitoin. That's uh Sharon Day's Indigenous Peoples Task Force. They are uh, they have a uh youth performance ensemble here in the Twin Cities. So the funding went there and then I was approached by the town town Minneapolis Neighborhood Association after they saw the artwork and wanted to know, hey, can we put that artwork on a banner? So working with them, I let them know, first and foremost, I am Lakota. I'm not Dakota. I am a guest here on Dakota land, just like you. So we worked with the downtown Minneapolis Neighborhood Association and helped them establish contacts and relationships here in the Twin Cities with with native community. Um, they first I ha first had them ask permission with elders in the community if my artwork could be used because I'm again I'm Lakota not Dakota and everybody loved it. They picked it uh, the the QR code here in the corner that takes uh, anyone who's walking by, by in that Mill City area. You scan that QR code. It'll take you to the downtown Minneapolis Neighborhood Association's landing page where they have an land acknowledgement and where you can donate to the Minneapolis American Indian Center. So from there, this year, all of our products here show, sold in the Guthrie gift shop, every single penny goes to the Minneapolis American Indian Center. From there, I had the Minneapolis Parks and Rec Board. We did you were on Dakota land banners for the new refractory down at uh, the pavilion down at Bade Makaska. Um, so those went up there. Uh, for me, this artwork means 
every time someone sees this artwork, I want them to know money has gone back to Native community. Um, this is something I would love for an organization or somewhere within in my home area in the in uh, the Black Hills and between Pine Ridge, Rosebud, Standing Rock, anywhere. Like if anyone wants the artwork to be able to put it on something and sell it for a for their for a uh, Native community, let me know. I would I would love to to do that. That's my goal with this. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adrian. I think I I think ending with that example is a is is like a a prime engagement of what can happen with the arts, right? That stemmed from a collaboration with the Guthrie and has not then spiraled out, right, to be able to impact these other spaces in Dakota land. And so I really appreciate that example and just drawing those connections between um, different like municipal spaces and creative art spaces. So I appreciate that a lot. And um, before we close, I know we have a couple of folks here in Zoom. If anyone has questions or affirmations, you could drop them in the chat. Uh, and just thank you all for joining us. I think uh, we need to talk about theater arts more. And maybe in, you know, you've mentioned a lot of really awesome folks throughout your conversation, um, talking about Larissa and Ty, uh, but also mentioning the one, you know, like we're all rooting for Lily Gladstone. Um, mm -hmm. And I st I haven't finished True Detective yet, but it is my partner and I started it together and they're gone. So I was like, I feel bad watching it on my own. So I'm waiting. Um, <laughs> but I will, I think even just in the first few episodes, just the portrayal of of Alaska Native people and um, just this tension between uh, settlers in our spaces and how we deal with that, especially when it's tied to science, I think is really important. Um, but if you, in closing, um, maybe just share out some more folks that we should follow uh, or organizations that um, we can tap into when we're interested in theater. And then also, where can we follow you on social media if, if you have spaces that we can look at the work that you're doing? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would say when it comes to theater here in the Twin Cities, my conversation I had with Sequoia Hawk last night, uh, they were talking about, we, we have a reading coming up of Marcy Rendon's at the Jungle Theater. Uh, it will be an ASL interpreted production that are reading that it sounds like most theater spaces don't have. So I think that important of inclusion is amazing. Uh, follow Sequoia Hawk, follow Marcy Rendon, uh, Sharon Day, Blossom Johnson. There are so many, so many uh, amazing people. Uh, Emmy, her many horses. She's writing, she's writing books now. So uh, Emmy is multi-talented. Um, uh, who else? Who else? Follow the Guthrie, uh, follow, uh, make comments, make suggestions, uh, any of these spaces. Uh, I don't, I don't know even locally within there what theater companies are doing, but follow them, ask them questions, ask them when, when there be more representation. If there's one thing the Guthrie learned with our production of For the People is non-natives do want to hear our stories. They do want to, 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 to see us perform. And, and when Lily wins on Sunday, that, that'll, that'll solidify that. Um, <laughs> you can follow me on Facebook. I have Instagram. I'm, I think it's adrian.zimaga at Instagram. Um, yeah. And if you follow me on either of those, I always share what I'm doing, what I'm up to, uh, the different people I work with. Uh, Isabella Star LeBlanc, follow Isabella. Uh, her father, Thomas LeBlanc, he has o Oyate Hutin here in the Twin Cities. They do a variety show in the in the Twin Cities here. Uh, he has a group called Buffalo Weavers. Sarah Pol uh, Polatsky Warza, follow Sarah. This is someone who's going to be directing, um, finding actors to act in plays. Uh, another person from community. I think we're all here operating and working here, but we really, really want we really want to be able to uh, bring some of that home and up, up, uplift people from home. Um, Wopila, 
Clementine and Peter and Mary at uh, Racing Magpie for, for inviting me to be a part of winter camp. Um, this is, I'm, I'm honored. I'm humbled and honored that I was asked to blab on for an hour <laughs> about things I do. <laughs> no, thank you, Adrian. I think it's really important that uh, we uplift uh, performance artists and and think about our storytelling methodologies as Ochete Shakoin people. And uh, just thank you for joining us for this winter camp where, again, we uplift, you know, Ochete Shakoin livelihoods through creative practice. So thank you so much. And I am going to end here.